Hey guys, my name is Eric with Keto for Carboholics, and today I've been asked to talk about keto and cardiology. Today I'm going to focus on one aspect of cardiology, and we're going to try to do sort of like a mini series, if you will, with these, where we're going to go through different topics related to different health conditions and how the ketogenic diet may affect those conditions. So today I'm going to start with keto and cholesterol, because that is certainly something that is talked about a ton in cardiology. And we're gonna talk about understanding the lipid panel, what types of things affect your lipid panel, how the ketogenic diet affects the lipid panel, and a term known as hyperresponders or lean mass hyperresponders, as well as people who are genetically predisposed to having higher cholesterol. If you hear the word lipid panel used throughout this talk, it's referring to your cholesterol panel. So the concentration of the different types of cholesterol in your bloodstream. So let's start with understanding the lipid panel. The lipid panel is generally broken up into a few different categories. Total cholesterol, triglycerides, HDL, known as high density lipoprotein, and LDL, known as low density lipoprotein. Additional lab testing may allow you to check for things like VLDL, which is very low density lipoprotein, or SDLDL, which is small dense, low density lipoprotein. Some of these different labs may cost you more money out of pocket because your insurer may not cover them as they're not typically part of standard lab testing. So what do we usually check in the clinical setting in terms of cholesterol? Usually we check a standard HDLP or lipid panel which consists of total cholesterol, triglycerides, HDL, and a derived LDL. The problem with a derived LDL rather than a direct LDL is that if your triglycerides are really high, this number will be grossly inaccurate. Historically, you may have had your clinician talk to you about your total cholesterol, particularly in primary care. This number tended to be focused on because we felt that if we got that number down lower, people would have fewer heart attacks. It's been shown that that is not really a reliable number, and so there's much less focus on total cholesterol now, and the focus has instead shifted to LDL. One of the reasons there's less focus on total cholesterol is because things like a high HDL, which is a good cholesterol, can affect that number. So again, the tension has been pushed away from total cholesterol and moved towards LDL. So the next thing in your panel tends to be triglycerides. In my opinion, this gets the least amount of attention when discussing your lipid panel, but it may be one of the more important values to pay attention to. Triglycerides are derived from sugar, although they are in your cholesterol panel, and is a storage form for sugar in the form of fat. It's not from fat in your diet, so dietary fat is not shown to increase triglycerides. So we'll move to the next part of the panel, but we'll come back to triglycerides later. The next part in a panel is typically HDL. HDL is what has been coined good cholesterol. HDL is called good cholesterol because of the impact that it has on LDL. HDL, when in higher concentrations, is shown to lower your concentration of LDL and is then considered to be good because it's in some ways cardioprotective. The job of HDL is to flow through the bloodstream and actually help to remove LDL particles that have tried to stick to the arterial walls. It will then bring them into the liver and then dispose of them there. So let's move on to the last portion of the typical lipid panel. LDL. LDL is considered bad cholesterol. It gets this name because when we're looking at coronary placking, carotid placking, we tend to see lipid deposits that are derived from low density lipoprotein. However, this in and of itself is a somewhat incomplete picture. The reason I say this is because we know that not all LDL is created equal. LDL actually ranges from small dense particles all the way up to large fluffy particles. And you may have heard that terminology used by your clinician. So large fluffy LDL is not considered athletic. Atherogenic. What I mean by that is it's not the particle type that is known to stick in the vessel walls and cause blockages within your coronary arteries or your carotid arteries. However, the small dense particles are associated with this, but the differentiation between the two does not happen on a typical lipid panel. So then what does that mean when you're looking at LDL numbers? Well, if you're going by the guidelines set by the American Heart Association, then that means you want to get that total number down as low as possible. The only problem with this is we still don't know that getting the total number is having any impact on on the small dense lipoprotein concentration. In cardiology, we see this in patients somewhat frequently when they have very well controlled LDLs based on the AHA standards of less than 70, some of them as low as in the 20s, yet they continue to have heart attacks. Now I told you we'd come back to triglycerides and this is where I'm gonna make that point. In these patients that continue to have heart attacks with well controlled cholesterol, good LDL concentrations of less than 70, these patients typically have a few other things going on in their lipid panel. They have low HDL, so they don't have enough cardioprotective HDL, and they have very high triglycerides. This is a common theme that I see amongst patients who continue to have heart attacks despite having what the American Heart Association would consider well-controlled cholesterol. So it can't be ignored that there are other pieces of the lipid panel that play a vital role in controlling your risk for coronary artery disease 
and carotid artery disease. However, those things do tend to get ignored. So what do we do going forward? Well, research that's coming out on the study of lipidology and cardiac risk factor modification is showing us that maybe our attention should actually be pulled away from just LDL and focusing more on the particle type that we know is responsible for coronary artery disease, specifically SDLDL or small dense LDL. This lab is available in some institutions, but typically this has to be drawn and sent out to those institutions for processing because the methods for determining particle size, concentration, number, and density are rather expensive and so most labs aren't doing them right now. This number is being seen more heavily in research as it's giving us further insight into what really affects cardiac disease risk modification. And so when we're talking about dietary studies, exercise physiology studies, or even drug trials, those types of trials are now starting to incorporate different lab measurements to determine what is having the greatest impact on long-term cardiac disease risk modification. So how does the ketogenic diet affect your cholesterol panel? Well, we know that people on a ketogenic diet utilize fats for fuel. One of the ways that they do that is through dietary fat. Another is through stored fat, when you have a caloric deficit. And the last way is through utilization of certain cholesterol components as energy. And so you will actually break down excess cholesterol and utilize that for energy as you're trying to make ketone bodies in the liver. This is seen notably with triglycerides because people with high triglyceride counts prior to implementing a well-formulated ketogenic diet tend to drop those numbers significantly. I'll give you an example of the range. People with metabolic syndrome tend to have triglycerides in excess of 400, bearing in mind a normal triglyceride concentration is less than 150, and some of them are up in the thousands. These people, when they implement a well-formulated ketogenic diet, often see their numbers come back down to normal range and even see it come into the ideal range of less than 90. So these are people who have a genetic predisposition towards having a high concentration of triglycerides and they see them come back down well into normal ranges. If you look at the HDL concentration, because you're introducing healthy fats into your diet, people tend to see these numbers come up. Again, people with metabolic syndrome, people with diabetes, and other people with congenital hyperlipidemia or dyslipidemia, meaning disturbances of their lipid panel, tend to see this number come up, even if they've struggled to have a normal or therapeutic HDL range in the past. Normal ranges for an HDL would be for males above 40, from females above 50, and therapeutic ranges for all would be at least above 50 and ideally above 60. So again, people who implement a well-formulated ketogenic diet, who've had a hard time in the past getting these numbers up, tend to see success in getting them back up into these ranges with this dietary approach. So let's move on to LDL and talk about what we see here. People implementing a well-formulated ketogenic diet most commonly see a reduction in total LDL in the research that looks at all risk factor modification, see a drastic reduction in SDLDL. Remember, that is the one that we really want to push down because it's related to atherosclerosis or blockages within the coronary arteries. Part of this is suspected to be because you've lowered your triglycerides and you've brought up your HDL, and part of it is just not understood at this time. But we know that people with lower triglyceride concentrations and people following ketogenic diets tend to have better concentrations and a better profile when looking at their LDL. So lower SDLDL and typically lower total LDL. So how about people who seem to have an increase in their LDL when they're on a ketogenic diet? The term used within the ketogenic spectrum for these people is hyper responders. And for those who are very, very thin and maybe athletic, the term that has been coined for them is lean mass hyper responders. As some of you may know, when you lose weight, you may have a influx in your serum cholesterol concentrations. So in the immediate weight loss period where you've lost a significant amount of weight, some people actually notice a bump in their triglycerides and some even notice a bump in their LDL. For the vast majority of people, this is a transient finding, meaning it will go away with time. As such, most people are recommended to check their lipid panel no sooner than three months and typically closer to six months. This will give you the truest representation of how your lipid profile is responding to this lifestyle change. Bear in mind, if you're going to check it around those times, it's only accurate if you're actually staying strict on a ketogenic lifestyle. If you're constantly having cheat days and you're constantly going over your macronutrient requirement, you may not get an accurate reflection of what your lipid profile is in response to a well-formulated ketogenic diet. You'll notice I keep saying that word throughout this talk, well-formulated. For those people who do have an increase in their LDL, the question becomes, is this harmful and is this something I need to worry about? Is this a reason to stop the ketogenic diet? For the vast majority of people, no, it is not a reason to stop the ketogenic diet. Because in the research looking at particle size, density, and concentration, these people are still seen to have a decrease in SDLDL, 
which is the one that, remember, is associated with atherosclerosis. So even though their total LDL is going up, they tend to still see a decrease in small dense LDL particle size and concentration. So with all this in mind, what else can we do to affect our lipid panel? Well, we do know that exercise is an additional method we can use to help positively impact our cholesterol panel. We tend to see people's triglycerides go down further when they implement exercise as well, although it's not quite as impactful as diet. We tend to see their HDL come up, and again, not quite as significantly as with the right diet, but this is a measurable change and can be beneficial. And in people who have elevated LDL, some of them have a further decrease in their LDL with the implementation of exercise. So that is something that if done right can help you to further impact your lipid profile in a beneficial way. Other things that can affect your lipid panel would be things like smoking and stress. Of course, they affect it in a negative way. Smoking tends to raise your triglycerides, it can also raise your LDL, and it is known to decrease your HDL. Smoking should be avoided by all persons, but if you're willing to make a significant lifestyle change, such as a ketogenic diet, I'm hopeful that you'll be willing to quit smoking if you are already smoking. Stress is another thing that is shown to increase triglycerides and decrease HDL. I'm not aware that they've observed an impact on LDL specifically, but the reason it increases triglycerides and decreases HDL is because when you're stressed, you release cortisol. When you release cortisol, your blood sugar levels actually tend to spike a little bit, and that further suppresses your HDL. So when your triglycerides are really high, your HDL is gonna be pushed down. So when you have high HDL, it pushes down LDL. When you have high triglycerides, it pushes down HDL. High HDL is not shown to push down triglycerides. So remember, sugar in the diet, stress, and smoking can all contribute to a higher concentration of triglycerides, lower HDL, and therefore you won't have the cardioprotective HDL to help lower your LDL, which in turn is shown to help lower your SD LDL. So what do we do with all this information? Well, if you're here, then hopefully you're implementing a well-formulated ketogenic diet that meets your macronutrient needs and is tailored to your metabolic requirements. Meaning, if you have any pre-existing metabolic health conditions such as diabetes, PCOS, metabolic syndrome, thyroid dysfunction, or anything else that can affect your glucose metabolism, you should be making sure that your macronutrient breakdown is reflective of that. People with those types of health conditions tend to need a higher fat to protein ratio, despite what you may read out there on other blogs saying protein can be used as the number one source of calories on this diet. Clinically speaking, this diet is a high fat, moderately low protein, very low carbohydrate diet. It's important to follow that structure, particularly if you're trying to help with things like the lipid panel, diabetes, and other health conditions. So guys, I hope you found that breakdown of the lipid panel and how the ketogenic diet can affect it helpful. If you found this useful, please share this with other people so they can have the right information when it comes to looking at your lipid panel while on a ketogenic diet. And if you really like this video, give us a like below and subscribe to our channel so you can see more of the information we have coming out soon on keto and cardiology, as well as keto and other health conditions that may affect you. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Oh, 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 oh,